Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marche, the webinar director at Advice Chaser. Before we introduce our guests and get started, I do need to do a bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own and, however true, funny, or interesting, are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. We're thrilled to bring you this educational presentation. Attendees are muted, but we encourage you to ask questions in the chat box, and I can see there's already one there about the recording. Uh, we will be hosting the recording on our YouTube channel, and you should get a replay link uh, in an email after this event. The presenters will answer questions during our webinar today as appropriate, and because we have so many attendees, uh, it's likely we'll, we will not be able to get to everyone's question. So if we don't get to your question in the chat box, go ahead and leave your phone number as well. And, and we'll reach out to you after today's event if we can't, if we haven't had a chance to uh, answer it during the presentation today. Well, we want this presentation and this educational experience to be as useful as possible. Please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. Well, I'd love to introduce you to today's uh, panelists. David Babb is a co-founder and principal of Stonebridge Asset Management, LLC. Stonebridge Asset Management is a registered investment advisor serving individuals, families, and businesses with investment and financial advice. Mr. Babb is also a minority owner of Coulter Bay Strategies, which serves as a general partner for the Yellowstone Fund, a limited partnership investing in Bitcoin. Our presenter today is Matt Haven, and he is the majority shareholder of Coulter Bay Strategies, the general partner for Yellowstone Fund LP. YSF is a cryptocurrency limited partnership that makes investments specifically in Bitcoin. Matt is the creator of the Navigator algorithm and automated trading architecture used for the Yellowstone Fund. Matt has been working with registered investment advisors and limited partnerships in algorithmic trading since 2013. He is a meteorology graduate from the University of Missouri and works as a data services manager for Barron Services, a provider of critical weather intelligence. He is responsible for the invention of a real-time tornado detection algorithm the Barron Tornado Index, which is used by over 100 TV stations nationwide to help save lives during severe weather events. And I'm so excited to have you folks here to present. And David, I'm gonna turn the time over to you, uh, say a few words, and then I know that Matt's going to um, have a wonderful time presenting to our wide audience today. Hey, thank you, Marche. Really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for being on the, the call today. Um, we hope to, you know, make this an informative, uh, hopefully entertaining as much as we can, not too terribly boring. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, asset class and certainly a very interesting time, you know, in cryptocurrency. Um, and so, Marche, if you could just flip to the next slide. Um, again, you can kind of see the agenda that we're, we're going to try to do. We want everyone to come away with this with a little better understanding of some terms and concepts that are being thrown around pretty, uh, you know, pretty well used. But we just want to make sure that everyone's kind of coming away with a better understanding of, you know, what is cryptocurrency, blockchain, um, the idea of decentralized uh, finance, a decentralized ledger. And then more importantly, there's some idea of just, just, you know, the idea of better education. And even if it were something that would fit in a portfolio, kind of how and why. So that's really what we want to uh, focus on. As Marche said, as you've got questions, uh, please just type them in the chat box and we'll just kind of go through them as, as we can. 
Um, you know, if we say something that makes you think of something, please uh, indicate in a chat box, uh, you know, the question. And I'll actually kind of kick this off. I'm curious as to if I say cryptocurrency in one word, what does that mean? To you. So if you are out there, you've got access to your, you know, the computer, just one word when I say cryptocurrency, what do you think of? So we'll wait just a second or two. Seeing some interesting responses. I've seen, and again, this one's come up quite a bit. It's interesting. The word freedom, gambling. Risky, you know, token, digital. So that's all, again, very, very interesting. And I think we'll be able to cover a lot of those concepts. <laughs> One word, uh, high electric usage. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, scam, that's interesting. I thought that uh, might come up. Uh, and we hope to try to maybe, you know, go through these concepts and debunk you know, a few things, address other concerns, and, and again, be as informative and informal as possible. So to everybody that, that kicked a word in there, really appreciate it. Um, if you don't mind, Marche, the next slide. So one of the ways that, that we think about cryptocurrency is we think of it from a techno technology or technological point of view. So as you can see over the last 50 years or so, that these there's some significant technological breakthroughs that, and you can also see they don't come around that often. Uh, you know, if you start with in the you know 70s, the the internet, you know, to email, to the World Wide Web, just think about that over about a decade from internet to web. Um, you know, how do we get along without the internet today? You know, we've got all the libraries of the world at our fingertips, basically, with, I don't want to say instantaneous, but pretty quick, you know, resources available to us. From e-commerce and how that transformed in tradition, the concepts of brick and mortar, to text messaging, and again, just collaboration, and to something that's become a lot more, and again, using it today, the, the video the live streaming protocol. Um, and you can see where that was a 2009. Again, about a decade later, you see those things come to fruition. And then finally, the blockchain protocol. So the, the idea or concept of cryptocurrency and something we'll talk about it more in more detail with uh, decentralized finance. Um, if you'll jump to the next slide. Okay, this was something I thought, just to kind of get everybody's head around the idea of digital assets. Um, in some cases, and in most cases, we're already using digital assets. You know, I came up with three easy little constructs to just say, you know, or if you've got gas points from your grocery store, if you're using Venmo or even airline miles by using your credit card. And, and the reason I say, you know, these are digital assets, you, you know, you basically are being rewarded. Um, for going grocery shopping, you have a either your phone number or some type of barca, some type of identifier that has an account created for you by your grocer. It's kept track of, and then it translates at some point in time, you're able to translate that or convert that into, you know, a commodity, in this case, gas. So you get a discount, you save money. So, so the idea of digital currency, again, is centralized. And, um, and so just the, the grocer maintains it, they keep the accounts, they keep track of it, you know, and then you're able to use it at your discretion. Venmo, the same thing. Now we're moving money. We're moving money from one bank to another bank. Again, centralized through Venmo, but the idea of, you know, dollars rapidly going, you know, basically from one smartphone to the next, and it's for available for all the folks that are on the Venmo system. Again, a centralized system. Venmo is responsible. They make sure all the connections, everything are correct. And, and then the same with, say, your Visa rewards, you know, for your airline miles. You're able to use, do your, you know, use your card, do your normal things. And at the end of the day, you know, you also have an account, a virtual account uh, that's got airline miles that you can then use for, for airfare, 
Um, and again, centralized system. And, um, uh, you know, and you've even in the past, not that we need to bring this up, but, uh, you know, there's been some consideration like it, in points in time where government's trying to figure out how to tax airline miles and things like that. So those are just kind of interesting things. But those are things that are in our daily lives. So digital assets have been around and been around for a while. Now, at this point, I wanted to bring Matt Haven in on the conversation because Matt, so there's digital assets. What's the main difference between cryptocurrency and what I just kind of laid out is, is a digital asset. Yeah, and the biggest thing is just being de decentralized, not having Venmo or Square or Kroger with gas points. You know, that one entity is not the one that's running those transactions. It's decentralized. It's a large pool, uh, a, you know, both around the country and around the world that can run that transaction network. Okay, so what you're saying is kind of a, all right, so we're taking the banks out, we're taking the middleman out from decentralized. So the biggest difference, is that what you're telling me between crypto and digital, as I described it, was it's just between you and I? Right. Yeah, and you still run the transaction through a specific location, but one advantage, and we see this in the computing world a lot too, is with decentralization, and having lots and lots of processing points that are distributed around the world, the a big benefit you get out of that is reliability. So specific okay. to the Bitcoin network, you know, your reliability since inception is the uptime is 99.98%. And for the last five years, because of the size of the network, it's basically 100%. So you can actually transact that you know, value 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no... There's no banking hours. You just do it whenever you need to do it. Okay, Matt. But but again, and Mar Marche, if you could go to the next slide. Um, how do we know, like, how do I know that it's going from, you know, if there's no central thing, what's kind of the backbone of this, Matt? You know, how are, how are they working together that, that allows me to send something to you without, say, using, you know, Square or Venmo? Or, or whatever? How do we know it's being done right? And we're, we're going to go through this a few times because this is the point where I think there's lots of confusion mm -hmm. when people talk about cryptocurrency. So Dave and I are going to go through these uh, ideas uh, a couple times here to really break it, it down into simple terms because people use all these complex terms and they don't do a good job explaining it. So the main thing, there's been a desire you know, for many decades to be able to do something like cryptocurrency. But it wasn't until, you know, more recently that we had high-speed internet globally and, uh, you know, the security, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, to be able to create a cryptocurrency and run it. So you're going to hear the phrase ledger or blockchain. You hear that over and over and over again, and people don't really explain it. The best way to think of that, it's just... A, basically like a giant list, a giant spreadsheet. In the case specific to Bitcoin, and each cryptocurrency has their own version of doing this, but in the case of Bitcoin, it's a long list of every transaction that has ever occurred in Bitcoin's history since it was created in 2009. So what happens is how can you tell it, is this transaction real or not? We with this decentralization, you have thousands of nodes which is just little computers that have copies of this list uh, of every transaction. And when a transaction occurs, you can go and quickly check multiple copies of that list in different locations uh, and validate and go, hey, we're trying to add you know, a new transaction to the list. Does this match up? I, theoretically, the, whoever has the longest list uh, that matches the other list is the right transaction. So if someone tries to fake a transaction, it's very quickly in a fraction of a second, you can check with nodes all over the world and see that you know this transaction didn't occur and it's false. Okay. Hey, one quick thing, Matt. Uh, we did get a request to, if you can adjust your mic. Uh, you, your voice may just be coming in and out. So I don't know if that's possible or not. But but on what you were just talking about, so so the concept again, this this blockchain or this register, or this list, and the idea of being de decentralized versus a can you know a central thing, 
is um, how do, and, and again, uh, uh, there's a good question that just came in. How do you make sure, like, how's the list verified? How do you check, you know, who's checking? Is it, you know, two guys, 200 guys, you know, because you use the term nodes and, and blockchain. So how does that kind of, how's everything reconciled? Can you explain the, that a little bit? In the case specific to Bitcoin, uh, there you have what's called miners. And mining, people talk about mining a lot. Just think of mining as your server farm. So like mm -hmm. if Google or Facebook is running their services, they have server farms all over the world mm -hmm. uh, that run the network. They run all the Google transactions. They do all that processing. In the case of Bitcoin mining, you have, you want to add this block of transactions, um, which is generally about every 10 minutes. You have a block of, hey, here's these transactions uh, to put onto uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. And you have to go through this expensive process of calculating, you know, doing this hard uh, math problem to validate. And whoever can do that the fastest wins. And they're the ones that get the reward as, you know, as a Bitcoin payment to do okay. that transaction but because it's hard and this is we get into the concepts and we can talk about this later in more detail proof of work versus proof of stake proof of work is hey you have to do this hard problem otherwise you know people could like spin up a bunch of computers and run a bunch of fake transactions if there's not work involved to validate it then you can't run this trustless based system where you know the work is is what you know, okay. proves that, you know, that transaction is real. Okay. So now what I'm going to try to do is say, okay, so what, what you explained is that we've got a, as opposed to one, like you use Google. Okay. So instead of having Google, it, you would have thousands of, of people. Okay. That are with their systems running these this kind of ledger if you will they've all got access to the database so the database is open it's free anybody mm -hmm. can see it they're able then to utilize that database and verify transactions so if you and i say that we did something then there's thousands of other people that can see it and they can verify the transaction marche can you flip to the next slide please um with, with that said, and you've talked about mining, I think we just got a question. Can you give a little, uh, uh, I don't say simpler, Matt, but, but maybe simpler, just, you know, because you talked about cryptography. Uh, we haven't used that word yet, but that's basically what you talked about when you said, hey, they've got a math problem they've got to solve. So the idea of how do you actually create, a, in this case, we're going to create a Bitcoin. So what do we do to create a Bitcoin? And then from that, take us to the next part, Matt. How is that added to this database that we just talked about, the decentralized database? So how do we make it? And then how does it get added so there can be a permanent record of it? Yeah, and historically, you know, with specific to Bitcoin, and each cryptocurrency has its own rule set of how, you know, a coin is created. Bitcoin has a hard cap of 21 million coins. And if you go back to the early days, the what what would happen is you would mine a coin and the miners would actually get paid a lot of Bitcoin. That was when Bitcoin was not very valuable. And they have what's called a halving cycle uh, that generally every two years, the amount of Bitcoin that the miner gets paid to process the transactions generally every 10 minutes is cut in half. So it used to be, you know, a Bitcoin miner would get, you know, a hundred coins or whatever okay. and now it's got to the point the last having cycle we went from 12.5 to you know 6.25 uh, two five. yeah but so, but what, so yeah, that is, that's how new coins are created in the case of bitcoin we have about eight over 18 million of the 21 million are already in existence mm -hmm. and so the miner whenever they do that transaction those additional coins get added to the blockchain and the okay. miner then generally they either hold them or they sell them for a local currency. But a lot of the actual transactions are with existing Bitcoin. It's not that we're having to always wait to create new ones because at this point, most of them that'll ever exist 
specific to Bitcoin mm-hmm. are already in existence. Okay. But again, let's, we'll take it even a deeper dive. And I say deeper, more simpler dive. So, so the miners or the guys with these nodes, the network, they're solving cryptography. They're solving a math problem. Okay. That math problem once solved represents or basically acknowledges on the network that there's, this is a Bitcoin. So, you know, whatever the answer is, thank you, um, Marche, um, that the nodes are in place, that this is accurate. Yes, the math problem, that's the correct answer. So the math problem is difficult to solve, but easy to verify, okay, by your network of guys. They then say, okay, and now we have a new Bitcoin and that Bitcoin is added to, or in this case, if somebody solved a math question today, they would get six, there would be 6.25 Bitcoin created to now the permanent ledger. And that ledger then is the, the history, the track, if you will, Matt, correct? Right. And just a minor clarification, um, mm-hmm. since you, you know, people are going to hear about nodes and mining, they are yeah. two different things. The nodes, okay. anyone can set up a lightweight node. The block, the Bitcoin blockchain history, you can go and download it. Right now it's several hundred gigabytes. So it easily fits on a modern hard drive. And you could set up, you know, with a, it doesn't take, a high-speed internet connection. It does take a certain amount of bandwidth per month to run that node. So a lot of people just volunteer to run these nodes just to keep copies of the Bitcoin blockchain as part of the community. Nodes don't get paid. The miners who do take advantage of the nodes and you know ver- pull information, they have their own copies of the blockchain. The miners are the ones that are actually getting paid to do the work, but the processing the miners have to do is... <laughs> extreme compared to a node is just basically that copy of your ledger also you know basically a right. multi hundred gigabyte spreadsheet with that transaction right. history okay um and and again i, I just saw fun and i say it made me laugh but somebody just just typed in you know pon that sounds like a ponzi scheme uh which which i guess is an interesting representation you know a ponzi scheme is to you know, uh, to, to say that money's coming in and you're using money from somebody else than to pay money, you know, like, Hey, your return is X. And I just went out and took some money from Matt to give to, you know, somebody named whoever, Mr. Ponzi, I guess. But, but again, that's interesting uh, because this is a little bit of a complication here that I think, and it takes some getting used to it's uh, like right now, we trust a bank. We go to a bank, we make a deposit. The bank is, you know, we don't necessarily say, hey, we want to see the money because we've got, you know, it's probably a check or we're setting up automatic deposit or whatever. But anyway, there's just a, an, accept, an accepted construct into our, our society that, that we have this. Uh, the second part of it is, you know, that bank then says, okay, we've got your cash and here's either a check or card. You can even get cash if you want. These are all accepted and you can use them anytime you want. Um, And again, you're looking at the bank, the bank, you always have to go through the bank. I think the biggest, and and I think what we're trying to get across here, uh, and it is complicated, is that you're kind of taking the middleman out. You're starting to go transaction to transact or person to person in in a trustless environment. The only way that person to person in a trustless environment can work is you've got to have some type of network that can be kind of self regulated or monitored. And in this case, the people that use the network or the many different, you know, there's roughly, I think today there's like 50,000 computers out there running and globally running, uh, you know, the, the blockchain for, for Bitcoin. And that's how they're able to make sure that, you know, as opposed to bank of America saying, yep, you've got a dollar and you can use it to buy, you know, a dollar's worth of goods and services. You've got this, you know, multiple, you know, nodes that are just, you know, computers that are just talking to each other and there, and no one owns it. So everyone has access to it, but no one actually owns it. So that's the biggest, I guess, for me, that's the hardest thing for me to wrap my mind around is this true idea of decentralization. Um, and yeah. David, yeah, I, mean, I would add, you know, with the comment, uh, the last uh, poster had about, you know, what is this thing? And right, I, I think the main thing is, if you look at it compared to technological innovations of the past, like mm-hmm. we had in that slide, think about the internet. 
the internet's not just, oh, well, the internet's how we get YouTube videos. Well, no, the internet's, at this point, it's millions of different things. So cryptocurrencies can be lots of different things to lots of different people. It's mm -hmm. not just an investment to some people. For some people, you know, in the case of El Salvador, which is, you know, the first country to officially adopt Bitcoin in the last few weeks, you mm -hmm. know, 20% of, uh, you know, money that's coming into El Salvador is remittance payments, generally from places like the United States. Um, so just being able to transact uh, value from one place to another place with low cost, uh, you know, it's not that, hey, I'm trying to buy Bitcoin to hold it for five years. For some people, they're just trying to take value and send it back to loved ones in El Salvador and mm -hmm. they get real value out of that. And it's not, oh, you know, a long-term thing. It's just, they transferred over and, you know, they're done the same day. So there's that, there's, you're going to have long-term investors. You're going to have speculators. There's a lot of different people in the space, just like what you see with any other technology. Uh, there's just many uses uh, depending on the person and the use case. Okay. And again, I'll try to, so, cause that you bring up an interesting point there, but basically you're saying, okay, so El Salvador is now, and this is, I guess, pretty recent that they're saying, well, Bitcoin works for us. It's a legal tender. We'll accept it. And now you're looking at a country that maybe doesn't have everyone where you have a high amount of people in the United States that all have bank accounts, maybe in El Salvador, you have a high number of people that don't have bank accounts. About, and about so 70%. Do okay, not. so 70% don't have bank accounts. So if we don't have bank accounts, how can we move money to and from? This is what you're saying is El Salvador sees this as a possible solution. You know, we have a high use of people with cell phones and internet, but we don't have a high group of people that have bank accounts. And now you have through cryptocurrency and this decentralized uh, process, if you will, you now have a way to transact currency or dollars or value over the, you know, in a way that actually can reach the people that are trying to, you know, do it and transact the, the, the exchange of value, if you will. Is that basically what you're saying? Yeah. I, again, that's, for me, that's one of those, I don't want to say mind blown, but that's, that's definitely a harder thing to get at because you're looking at where the infrastructure doesn't exist physically, but now you're able through, you know, through the internet to, to, to tra continue to transact and do business. So that seems to be quite a, like you said, a technological advantage. Um, and, and we'll see from an adoption rate how it stands out. Currently, Salva El Salvador is the only country that takes it as legal currency right now or legal tender. And that's Bitcoin, specific to Bitcoin, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, well, and again, with that, we still come back to blockchain. And with the blockchain, that's kind of that record. You know, how do we make sure, you know, can you kind of describe that again, specific to uh, Bitcoin, how blockchain works, how it's verified. And again, try to keep it as high, you know, high level as you can, um, you know, just to kind of put a bow on this. Yeah. And specific to Bitcoin, it's primarily just used for that transaction history of, hey, here's a big list. Go check the copies of the list with other people and make sure it's valid. In the case of other cryptocurrencies, you know, as we get, talk about Ethereum, uh, well, then you're getting well, into... I was going to say, hold up on that just one second before we get to Ethereum. But is that is there just one person checking the list or is everybody check all the people that have access to it? Is it their responsibility to check the list and, and make sure where, that it's accurate? And this is where the miners come into play, because as the new block comes out of, hey, here's the list of the new transactions about every 10 minutes specific to Bitcoin. The miners are in a race to go validate those transactions and whoever can do it first wins and that's so that the speed of the network um, can go as fast as it possibly can um, and still be efficient. We don't want to sit and wait five hours for something to happen when it should happen in 10 minutes. So, you know, because of that, there's a huge incentive for the, you know, everyone to go check the, the latest uh, uh, transactions and process those as fast as possible. So you get in a situation where it's, it's never just one person. It's, many miners all over the world that are looking at the same information. Okay. All right. 
Um, next slide, please. Do you want to skip this one about blockchain I, or Bitcoin? I, just for, I mean, for now, I think we've, you know, because this is really the biggest concept is just the idea of the decentralized. But yeah, if you could, you could skip that for now. Thanks, Marche. And now we start to get into, you know, assuming that, that, you're looking at, you know, the different, I think as Matt was getting into different, different cases of, and that's an actual, a, a good question. We just had a really good question. I'll finish this thought, but one of the ideas, like you own different cryptocurrencies have different uses. We've been talking a lot about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is one of the largest. It's the oldest. It's got the most, I guess, I guess the highest number of users or adoption, if you will. Um, when, when people look at Bitcoin, they look at the price of Bitcoin and they talk about basically like an aspirational store of value. So they're, they're uh, kinning it to gold. And so if you look at this chart, you see all that volatility. And that's people get really, really scared about the volatility. Well, if you look closely, this is not a chart of Bitcoin. This is a chart of the price of gold for the last hundred years. So you have, you see quite a bit of volatility just in the price of gold, but yet gold is accepted globally as a store of value and as a hedge against inflation. So you interestingly see some of the same risk characteristics when you look at this chart to gold versus Bitcoin. And you see right in there, if you look in the 1950s section, you see it kind of slide and then it precipitously drops. You are looking at when the dollar comes off the gold standard. So no longer is there anything backing the US dollar. It used to be up until that drop you see right after 1950, used to be gold. Now it's not. The, it's just the good faith and credit of the United States government is what backs your dollar. And then you see the price of gold rise, fall, rise, fall, crash in the 2000s, and then rise again. So I, I just found that interesting that a 100-year chart of gold looks a heck of a lot like a 10-year chart of, of cryptocurrency. And with Bitcoin specifically, I, we're going to use the word aspirational store value because you know I don't want to even pretend like Bitcoin and gold have the same risk characteristics. They do not. There's a lot no. more volatility in Bitcoin. Um, you know, you're in an infancy of an asset class versus gold is, you know, 100 years old, very well established and generally accepted as an inflationary uh, part of somebody's uh, portfolio. Um, now, uh, Marche, there was a question I thought was pretty interesting that just came across and it's gone. Yeah. I can't. Uh, uh, and, what keeps these faceless miners from corrupting the system? I think that is a great question. Uh, Matt, how does everybody not just collude or, or you know, why doesn't that happen? Or why wouldn't that happen? Yeah, and the, the best thing to read up on that, if you, if you look for the term 51% attack, there's the, with the way the mining infrastructure works for different cr cryptocurrencies, specific to, we'll just talk about Bitcoin in this case. Yeah, just, yeah, focus uh, on Bitcoin, right. You know, you'd have to have a majority of the mining equipment and the mining power to basically win over where you can basically, you know, keep winning the transaction processing so you can mm -hmm. corrupt it. But right. with Bitcoin's aligned incentives, it would be kind of silly to do that. One, it would cost billions of dollars to buy all of the mining equipment to become and, to where okay. you'd have a majority stake of the mining power. And then also, if you get to where you corrupt it where people people will instantly realize that you're falsifying transactions you're going to destroy the value of that specific cryptocurrency so you're going to right. spend a lot of money and then take away the value of the system of what, of what you st all right let me let me back up then because that's interesting so when we're saying mining again we're talking about computing power so when you're saying equipment you're talking about just you know high-powered computers yeah, so specific. you have to buy right and um, in Bitcoin's case, you know, in the olden days, you could plug in a computer and let it run. You know, I'm talking right. about two, 2011. Right, right. It would mine Bitcoin for you. As time has gone on, we've come up with more and more specific equipment. Now we just make what's called an ASIC miner that's okay. made just to mine Bitcoin. All right, my head just exploded. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it's just, just exploded. It's just, but your point is there's specific, there's specific equipment for, you know, this type of, and it's, and again, specific computer equipment. There's a good, a good comment again. And I really like this. And I like how this chain of thoughts going is that, well, you know, billions of dollars. Well, that's a lot of money for you, a lot of money for me, a lot of money for most people on this call. But for certain countries, a billion dollars is nothing, you know. And so Russia specifically, um, if they're going to decide to do this, um, you know, what would keep them from just spending all the money they need to to basically recreate a fake ledger to more or less take over this particular, like in this case, Bitcoin. But I think you brought up a great point, Matt. And when you said they wouldn't do it because they spend a billion dollars to hack or take away something. So it basically takes the value to zero. So yeah, you just, by stealing it, you basically make it worthless. You make it worthless. And also trying to acquire all that equipment, you're mm -hmm. gonna have to acquire miners that are already in the United States and Germany and Iceland and all right. over the world. And there's a lot of people, they're never going to sell it to someone that's gonna do sure. that. It's just a function of time. It, Theoretically, if you want to spend tens of billions of dollars and somehow round up the majority of the mining equipment in the world and concentrate it all in one place, also that you can affect the, well, pretty much corrupt the cryptocurrency and destroy the value. You could do right. that if you want, uh, but it just, you know, that's going to be a very expensive task. For well, it's an expensive somebody. task. And this kind of goes into, uh, uh, Marche, if you could jump to the slide that basically talks about the different types of cryptocurrency, you're not just talking about one thing. You're not just talking about, uh, you know, the, um, the, you know, Bitcoin only, like that's the only cryptocurrency. You know, there's thousands of cryptocurrencies that are out there. So... And, I, and, I and would then they, have, they have different purposes, correct? They have different purposes. And, you know, in the case of mining, you know, back to what, you know, the last comment was, it's totally different hardware. Bitcoin has ASIC miners. Ethereum, people are using GPU, graphical processing unit, you know, gamer, video game cards. Mm -hmm. uh, people use those to mine Ethereum, which is why if you want to buy a high-end NVIDIA gaming, you can't find one right now. You know, they're all like twice the MSRP because people have been using them to mine Ethereum. So if you're going to, okay. you know, if you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to do a 51% attack on Ethereum. Okay, we're well, going to have to run up most of well, the video game cards that are in people's systems all over uh, the world. Okay, well, let, let's take a step back from that because I'm, um, I'm, let me take a step back from that because I'm sitting here looking at, you know, the different cryptocurrency. So you, you've got Bitcoin, you've got Ethereum, um, you know, we talked about that and we're talking about use cases, you know, so there's obviously there's just yeah. different things where Ethereum and you see out there on the, the charts, a smart contract. So it's you're looking at something constituting like, you know, uh, programmable money, which is an, a concept we're just kind of bringing out here. Bitcoin, an aspirational store of value. There's other cryptocurrencies that are trying to basically they focus on speed or trying to be payment systems, if you will, you know, actually want people to use them and, and use them to uh, uh, buy and sell things, you know, amongst each other. So, you know, we're just, I guess we were just trying to make the case here that, um, that it's, uh, you know, the smart contract, if you will, is just a way to um, conduct uh, it kind of an if then statement, if you will. So with Ethereum, that's more of a technology. Um, Bitcoin is more of an aspirational store value, meaning that you would, you would want to own it and just, you know, it would over time go up in value. Ethereum is, is a crypto asset that you would want to own. If you are considering or looking at the idea that the, that the technology was going to continue to be adopted and grown and, and, uh, and go forward there. So you wind up with value there. We're kind of running out. I mean, we're at, uh, I guess, we're what, at about 1140. I wanted to make sure. Um, that would be a different time zone to, to other people. Uh, but I apologize. No yes, thank worries. You. It's all right. Um, we can keep going. And if we go a little bit over the top of the hour, I just want to say people have uh, asked if they will get a recording. We will send out a replay link, and then we will also be hosting this recording on our YouTube channel.
Sure. Um, yeah. And David, I, I would add here that, you know, there, there's a lot of emotions that are involved in the cryptocurrency okay. space. The big, right. the big thing, you know, going back to the early internet, look at how many versions of search engines we had before Google came out and then just dominated everything. So mm -hmm. we're going to see a lot of innovation in the space. Um, you know, this is kind of just the beginning of all of it. Uh, so we don't, the future, you know, it can change right in front of our eyes. So we have Bitcoin today, we have Ethereum, we have thousands of other cryptocurrencies. There's lots of neat new things that are being worked on by very, very smart people. Uh, so, you know, some of the new crypto of the future that'll do new things that we haven't even seen yet, you know, is mm -hmm. like, likely to be coming out in the years ahead. Uh, so it'll, it'll be very interesting. Yeah. And, and so with here, again, I was, uh, and I think Matt, you're, you're really spot on with, with this, this concept. Um, you know, we'll see what, what kind of develops. We'll see what kind of uh, takes shape, you know, as we were looking at why you would own it in a portfolio or why not own it. And again, if you, if you felt inclined that this was something that you, you know, believed in, like where there was uh, inflation protection, if it was disruptive technology, diversification in the portfolio, and we can go back and you can, you can run, there's some, you know, pretty sharp guys, uh, that have, you know, done some, some studies. So uh, I just specifically like Yuri and Timmer at Fidelity. Uh, there's a couple of ETF firms out there where they've gone and they've looked at adding small amounts of cryptocurrency into a portfolio and what kind of risk return uh, characteristics you get. And it, again, is similar to owning, say, commodities uh, in a portfolio. Uh, you get you know, some pretty decent risk return. And again, we're talking allocations and in, in, in the cryptocurrency, you're talking in the one, two, 3% space. Uh, you know, you're not talking about big, big allocations. And part of the reason you don't is the risk return profile is pretty high. You've got a lot of return over the last several years. You've got a lot of volatility as well. And that speaks to, again, the cons. You've got volatility. You've got regulation. Um, up until recently, there was some consideration as to how it would actually be taxed. And right now, the IRS looks at cryptocurrency as, as property, and so it's taxed that way. Um, the SEC and FINRA don't look at it as a security. Again, they don't look at it as a, a, like a stock or a bond. They do look at it as property as well. So, and then you also have the issue of lack of adoption. Again, to Matt's point, you know, you started out with a lot of different firms or a lot of different, he used the example of search engines, a lot of different search engines. Um, and then you wound up with, you know, kind of some winners and, and, and losers in the process. But those are just on the surface, not to get into. And again, obviously you always consult with your own financial professional before you, uh, before you think about doing this uh, or making any investment into, into this. You know, there's, there's a, it's extremely volatile, um, and we've seen the price, you know, fluctuate just in the last year, you know, very, very uh, broadly. So, um, you know, but just again, some quick pros and cons. Can we go to the next slide? And again, you know, how can you own it? If you're inclined to, there's, there's reputable firms. Coinbase is the largest crypto exchange. You've got PayPal Square. Uh, you've got large financial institutions like JP Morgan and fidelity that you can custody your assets there. And then in some of the more esoteric, or, or I guess uh, you've got limited partnerships, which have a set of criteria, you know, accredited investors and, and liquidity issues. And then you have things, and people may have heard of Grayscale uh, Bitcoin Trust, and that's a, a, a unit trust basically, or investment trust that you can buy or hold in your portfolio. Although be aware, and again, consult your financial professional there. The, the grayscale can trade at significant premiums or discounts. And again, that's probably for a topic on a, uh, another day. Matt, would you add anything in terms of, you know, yeah. how would an individual own cryptocurrency? The, the options we have listed are, you know, a little easier and more straightforward. If you're willing to do the, the work and do the research and understand what you're doing, you can personally possess cryptocurrency you know in the case of bitcoin you can get what's called a you know a, a hardware wallet uh where you know you'll have a copy you have you know your specific bitcoin onto you know that hardware device but there's you know everything has risks 
you have to know what you're doing. You have to know how it's backed up. You, your loved ones have to know that you own this on this device. Otherwise, when you go, then that's lost. So uh, you definitely need to do, you know, thorough research with with any of the options that you're looking at. Yeah, I, that's I think that's well said. Uh, you know, good research. Look at the reputation. If you're interested and want to do a deeper dive, you know, into this, which we 100% suggest you do, um, you know, there's a CFA Institute. If you go to their website, there's a really good uh, white paper uh, that, that really breaks it down, does a good job of kind of explaining a lot of the topics that we talked about. And because, you know, they have a, it's, it's, even though it's a, a, for investment professionals, it says it in the title, I, you know, it's a really good resource, I think, for just anybody that's interested. And excuse me. And then the Bitcoin standard, Matt, this is, I guess, one of your more favorite books that you have. Uh, yep. So yeah, if you. Excellent summary of Bitcoin's history and the incentives uh, in the Bitcoin ecosystem and, you know, what, why it's grown to what it is today. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, really it. Um, you know, again, not advice or anything. We were hoping this could just be educational today, trying to, uh, uh, you know, and please, if you've got additional questions, you know, make sure that you submit them to either the chat or, or directly to advice chasers so we can do our best to, uh, uh, you know, get those questions answered, additional detail or whatever we can do for you to kind of help you. You know, we think it's an interesting time. It's certainly not something we're suggesting everybody invest in. We just think that there's enough news and noise and real and not real that go into this that, um, that, that it's worth having discussions about. And, uh, you know, is it an opportunity? You know, is it something that makes sense in portfolios? And to some degree, you know, as you see this industry mature, as you see these opportunities shape out, as you see technologies advance, uh, you know, some of these things with decentralized, you know, finance, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of see how it, how it plays out. But again, we think it's certainly an interesting space and we've gone and spent a little bit of time to learn a few things about it. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly think it's something that will be around for, for uh, uh, quite a while. So with that. So we have some time to answer some questions. Um, okay. I, I, I know that you have some common questions, David, that, that people generally reach out. I do have a question here. Um, what about illegal activities? How, how, does, how does cryptocurrency work with that? Okay. And Matt, do you want to address that? Yeah, I mean, specific to Bitcoin, you know, if you go back to, you know, 2013, I think that was probably the most common thing in the news was that you heard, you know, oh, you know, people are buying all sorts of illegal things and drugs on, on mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Uh, and the volumes, you know, back then were actually pretty high. The thing is, like we've talked about with the Bitcoin ledger, there's thousands of copies of all these transactions. And it actually makes it very easy to track down these money flows to a specific location. So what's happened over the years is, you know, the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, they, they've come out with their own tools to actually, you know, trace through uh, ledgers on different cryptocurrencies. And nowadays, you know, it'd be incredibly dumb to be, you know, doing a lot of these activities that used to be fairly popular. Um, and because of that, we, we've seen the illicit activity has completely collapsed. You know, it's a fraction mm -hmm. of a percent as of last year mm -hmm. uh, versus, you know, being much higher in the past. Uh, most of your illicit activity is still done with the same thing it's always been done, which has been physical cash. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's from a technology standpoint, the technology has enabled this, but also because of the open nature, uh, law enforcement agencies can use the data to quickly you know, crack and, down on whoever it, it's just, and, and Matt, we saw that, that is. Yeah. Right. And we saw that with the uh, colonial, with the, the pipeline most recently, you know, they, right. there was a ransomware, they wanted payment in Bitcoin law enforcement was able to actually trace the trail and they were actually to find the guys and then recover the assets. Right. And that was finding their server most likely not that they, you know, were able to pull the Bitcoin, you know, off the, Bitcoin right. network and 
pull it over. But, to but again, the idea that it's illegal, it's faceless. Well, there's really, you know, where that, you know, your, your actual name might not be there, but the transaction history is there and you're able to follow effectively. You can follow the money, so to speak. Yeah. And a lot of the, you know, in the regulatory environment, there's more and more in the, the space to make it, you know, there's know your customer. There's, there's more and more stuff to make it harder and harder. You know, we're going to see, you know, even though it's very, very low today, you're going to continue to see those numbers. Drop. Right. Right. Well, that, again, very, very interesting. Uh, Marche, is there another there, question? There's another question. Um, I've heard that the cryptocurrency is hard on the environment. Can you speak mm -hmm. to that? Yeah. In the, well, the main thing is, you know, the two biggest players today are Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, Bitcoin, and they both do the same thing. They both have a, a proof of work uh, mining uh, methodology instead of proof of stake. Ethereum is looking at going to proof of stake, which is they're not doing, which actually affects the whole decentralization. It makes Ethereum less decentralized uh, because then you've got certain basically leaders that determine the validity of the, of, you know, is this transaction real or not? But right now, you have to go do those pro that processing, which is the value of Bitcoin and Ethereum have gone up, the complexity of the algorithms have gone up, and you have to spend more electricity with the mining equipment to actually do the transaction. So what's happened is, you know, if you're in a place like Iceland that's using hydropower and geothermal energy, you know, it's, it's clean energy. But in places like China, you know, where... You know, some parts of China, depending on the time of year, you know, maybe it's heavily coal power uh, and that's not clean. Um, one of the things we are seeing, you know, especially in the last couple of months is, and this goes back to 2017, you know, China is, is cracking down on trying to get uh, crypto miners out of the country and then in the process of moving out. What we're going to see is a lot of that equipment. Right now it's estimated Depending on how you measure it, 40 to 70% of Bitcoin mining is using renewable energy, which is a lot higher than you know normal use for other applications. But what we're seeing is for any new mining, it's increasingly cleaner. And also there's you know, there's a big understanding in the industry to try to go to the cleanest, cheapest energy. So I think it's gonna be exciting actually in the next year, maybe in the next few months, with watching uh mining equipment moving out of dirty places um to places that have cheap renewable energy i mean we have we have an insane amount of surplus energy just in uh canada you know if you look at hydro quebec which is one of the biggest hydropower uh power electricity generators in the world uh you know it's been estimated you could pretty much run the entire bitcoin mining network off of hydro quebec and most okay. of that's just off a of surplus waste energy they're not even using today. Well, and and I think that's more of the the this the sum it up. That's you know there, you you have the availability. It's not just all coal fired and and not clean energy. You're not using it at peak hours. It's a global system that's running energy that. Uh, that you're able to use off-peak production. You're able to use, you know, cheaper, clean power. So a little bit of a misnomer in that it requires energy to use, but the fact that, you know, you have the entire global power grid to, to utilize and, and, and with some thought, you can even maybe do it more efficiently and even more environmentally friendly. Yeah, if, if Ethereum goes to proof of stake and they find a good way to make that work, then, you know, mm -hmm. you'll have a huge amount of energy drop off, probably 99 plus percent okay. drop off in that situation. So, you know, just and because something has been a certain way, don't assume it's always going to stay that way. The technological innovation in the space is huge. So mm -hmm. as problems arise, there's a lot of people that are trying to figure out how to do it better. There is, you know, a okay. deep interest in making this better and better as time goes on. Yeah. Okay. Um, what other questions do we have? I know we're maybe getting close to the, the end of time. Oh, just a second. I wanted to make sure I was off of mute. Uh, you talked a little bit about regulation and about um, how the government taxes things. Can you speak a little mm -hmm. bit more about how and, that might evolve? I, and I'll, I don't 
again, we, we don't give tax advice. I'll say that. But currently, the only thing that I can speak to on it is, is what the IRS is, how they tax it right now. And they tax it right now um, as, as property. So you basically, if you hold it for more than 12 months, it's, it's long-term capital gain. Less than 12 months is short-term capital gain, which is taxed as ordinary income. That's how they're doing it now. But there's plenty of consideration and and discussion about well should it be taxed should it even and this is you know with the sec and fenra you know should it be a security is it not you know is it a security and if so then that brings in a, a whole new set of regulations and, and would bring in tax you know tax implications so there's been quite a bit of discussion and again um, the, that CFA paper that I talked to you about, it actually does a really good job. You can flip near the back and that will break down yes. kind of the current tax situation for you uh, and, 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 you know, and kind of show you where it was and where it is and then maybe even potentially where it could wind up. So. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, someone, okay. wrote, someone wrote in a uh, confidence in altcoins being used as legitimate currency, or are these mostly a cash grab for the creator? Do you know anything about that topic? Uh, well, again, and when you're talking altcoins, you're talking about like, so you've got, say, the two main ones that we talked about, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then you have altcoins. There's, I want to say, and Matt, I may have this wrong. I think there's, what, somewhere between eight and 10,000 crypto coins that are out there right now. Yeah. I mean, I could go create a new one this afternoon if I want. Right. To. It's right. not hard. So it, it, I'll say this, Matt, let me, let me jump in here. It, it's going to be about adoption. It's going to be about the use case. Like what, if you're looking or evaluating alternative coins, look at what are they trying to accomplish with the alternative coin? Or is it just like you say, a cash grab? Is it just, well, I just made it. What does it do? Well, I don't know. Doesn't do anything. It's just there. Um, or like specific to Bitcoin, does it have a store of value? Or specific to Ethereum, does are we trying to utilize the technology, the smart contracts, the programmable money? Are we trying to solve for uh, you know some societal or some type of use case? You know, from from a finance point of view, from decentralized you know finance point of view. Uh, so you have to do a little bit of homework. Uh, to, to try to determine it. And then there's, there's products out there. Again, do your homework there. You can invest where you can invest in a basket of cryptocurrency. You don't just necessarily have to pick one or the other. And I think as things develop, Matt, maybe you talked about this. I don't think it's going to be like an either or, like it's only this or that. I think there'll be multiple cryptocurrencies out there that have multiple purposes, um, you know, similar to commodities, similar to currencies, you know, that we see, uh, you know, in today's environment, that that's kind of what I see. So yeah, long winded, but I, I hope that kind of answers your question. You just have to understand what the coin's trying to do. Yeah. The technological innovation combined with the user adoption curve is going to be the bulk of it. The, mm. the, and we all know that those of us that have been in the crypto space know it's a very emotional space. Everyone has very strong opinions about their favorite cryptocurrency, but if you step back from it, it probably is going to look a lot more like the internet where there's, you know, you have a lot of different websites you use every day. And it's not like this website is slightly different than the other. They each have their own use case and you derive value from, you know, whatever those sites that there are. Uh, and they can all live in, you know, some form of harmony. But, you know, if they're providing value, then, you know, then they'll grow and the adoption will increase over time. Well, folks, thank you so much for being here. We have run out of time. Uh, we will be doing a follow-up webinar with Matt and David about cryptocurrency. So look for an, uh, for your email for, for information about that in the future, or you're welcome, of course, to go to advicechaser.com and, uh, and give, us a, give us a short message. So on behalf of Advice Chaser, I want to thank our panelists for being here and the organizations that have worked to bring you this webinar today. Thank you so much for attending. As I said before, look for an email with a, a replay of this event. And you're welcome to share that replay with friends and family. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who is a great fit for you, your life, and your financial questions. 
Our matching service is free for you, and every one of our advisor partners has committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you so much for coming, and we'll see you at another webinar soon. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.